All right. Uh, good evening, I have to say. I'm based in Berlin. My name is Sebastian and my, my co-host, Oriana, is in New York, where it's, I guess it's good morning, Oriana. Yeah, exactly. It's only 11 a.m. here. I have so much more day left. Yeah, so I'm really excited to be here uh, with all of you. And uh, um, um, since um, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, uh, about an hour of time and the plan is to separate the time between Oriana and myself. And we'll start with you, Oriana, and I'll quickly introduce you to, to the uh, to, to the list. Um, but just quickly before... Um, before we, something's going on. Um, just click, uh, quickly before uh, we start. So if you have any questions uh, while we are, either of you of us are talking, please ask them in the chat or in the uh, Q and A section, and we'll try to answer them as quickly as possible. Um, but back to you, Oriana. So um, you've spent more than a decade working in the media. You're currently uh, the senior journalism outreach lead at Kickstarter, where you help people to start print digital audio projects. You're also a writer. She, you, you, she's written for edit and edited for a, a variety of outlets, including Vice, MTV News, Slate, Pitchfork, The Believer, and many others. She's also written a book called Brooklyn Spaces, 50 Hubs of Culture and Creativity about creative places across New York City. So um, over to you, uh, other side of the Atlantic, and uh, uh, take it from here. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you all so much for being here. It is weird to sit and just listen to my bio be read and have to keep smiling. Um, but I hope that wasn't. Uh, Anyway, uh, that's me. That's true. All of those things are correct. Um, so I am. I have a presentation. It's got slides. It's got plenty of gifts to keep you interested. It'll take like 20, 25 minutes. Um, and then I will turn it back over to Sebastian. So I just was taught how to do this in uh, with the tech. So let's really hope that it works. I'm going to share my screen. And if I do it right, you will see my presentation. So share. And then come over here. Looking good. Yeah? Yes, it works. OK. Can you see where it says Kickstarter? Yes, we can. Do you see my notes? No. <laughs> yes, I did it right. OK. <laughs> all Great. right. OK, so um, hello, and thank you all so much for being here. Uh, uh, yeah, as I, as Sebastian kindly said, I'm Kickstarter's senior journalism outreach lead. Before this, I spent about a decade as a journalist. Um, I never thought I would have a job like this, but it turns out that getting out into the media to help people get paid for their work is the most exciting and inspiring thing I've ever done, which is corny, but also true. Um, so let's see, I'm going to start this presentation by talking broadly about what Kickstarter is and does, then I'm going to share a variety of recent projects that in the Kickstarter journalism space, and then I'm going to break down the main elements of a successful crowdfunding campaign, and at the end I'm happy to answer some questions. Um, but as Sebastian said, <coughs> type your questions into the chat. I now have a whole like double screen situation happening. So even if you want to talk to me, I can't see where you're typing until after I shut this off. So, okay, now I'm gonna start. Oh no, wait. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Kickstarter is an online crowdfunding platform where creators make something to share with others and backers pledge to support those projects financially. Kickstarter is only for creative work you cannot use it to crowdfund things like medical bills, charitable donations, or investment funding. Our entire mission is to help bring creative projects to life. Kickstarter is a public benefit corporation. Um, no worries if you don't know what that means. I didn't either before I got this job. A public benefit corporation is essentially a mission-driven for-profit company that has committed as part of its corporate charter to consider the impact of all of its decisions on all of society, not just on shareholders. So having a positive impact on the world is part of a public benefit corporation's legally defined goals. At Kickstarter, that means that everything we do comes back to supporting, serving, and championing artists and creators. We do, of course, try to make money, <clears throat> but unlike a typical corporation, maximizing profits is not our main goal, and we won't ever seek profit if it's at the expense of our mission. 
Since the company launched in 2009, we've seen some pretty incredible stuff. More than four and a half billion dollars have been pledged to campaigns on the site and more than 170,000 projects have been brought to life. During that time in just publishing and journalism, we've seen more than 50,000 projects bring in nearly $190 million. To put that in context, uh, in the US, the National Endowment for the Arts has distributed about $120 million in funding for literature cumulatively since 1966. So we're a public benefit corporation and we focus exclusively on creative projects. Something else that sets this company apart from other crowdfunding platforms is our all or nothing model. If a Kickstarter campaign doesn't reach its goal, the creator doesn't receive any of the funds. This idea is baked into Kickstarter's DNA. We operate this way because we wanna encourage creators to have a clear sense of how much money they need to complete their project. So no one is trying to bring their idea to life with an incomplete budget. Uh, if a campaign doesn't reach its goal, that just means that some element of the project likely needs tweaking, whether it's the idea itself, the creator's outreach plan, or something else. There's nothing wrong with that. It just means that the project still needs work. As Spike Trotman, a comic artist who has run more than 20 Kickstarter campaigns, has put it, a failed Kickstarter is a dodged bullet. Of course, I really want all my creators to succeed. That's one of the reasons I'm here, because I want to set up everyone who uses the platform for success. So let's get back to journalism. <coughs> this is, of course, a critical time to be working on new ways to fund the media. The industry is rife with venture capitalist vampires, corporate malfeasance, union busting, and decimation via Facebook duplicity. It gets clearer every day that the old financial models are woefully inaccurate in the modern age. So media organizations are looking into a range of alternative revenue streams, from non-profit non partnerships, to event series, to philanthropic philanthropic support. And something else is finally happening. Readers are finally getting the message that if we want journalism to continue to exist, we're going to have to help pay for it. So while it's hard to deny that these are dark days for the media, I do see this as a great silver lining. Community supported journalism is on the rise all over the globe. Last year, the UK's slow journalism experiment, Tortoise, raised half a million pounds on Kickstarter, and Dutch site, The Correspondent, raised 1 million euros all on their own. That's to say nothing of new subscription models, multimedia partnerships, and niche publications with fiercely dedicated communities. I'm an irrepressible optimist, and I happen to believe that this is an incredibly exciting time to be working in this space, doing my tiny part, you know, to save journalism. So now I'll share some publishing and journalism projects that our platform has helped bring to life. One of the things we like to say is that every Kickstarter project is a story. I really love working with people in the media because they understand what that means right away. On Kickstarter, you're not just selling something, you're explaining why your project matters, and not just to you, but to everyone who might wanna become part of it. You're not asking for a charitable donation or an investment with the expectation of return. You're asking people to support your creative journey and also to join you on it. Kickstarter campaigns have been used to fund everything from legacy media outlets to tiny DIY zines, from entire news organizations to single podcast episodes. Most of the projects in this presentation were made by US and UK based creators, but that doesn't mean that no one is using the platform in other places, like for example, Berlin. These are just a few of the awesome media projects that have been launched in the last few years from your fine city. Oh, whoops, sorry, skip that one, Never mind. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start with a few more now. Um, this was a very big deal in New York City, although I don't really know whether it made it all the way over the Atlantic. Um, but a few years ago, a malevolent billionaire bought a successful and very beloved network of local websites, and then he unceremoniously shut them all down after the staff voted to unionize. The flagship site, Gothamist, was able to partner with a nonprofit radio station to relaunch, but their previous owner was holding the site's archive hostage. So they ran a Kickstarter campaign to buy back their own work. Gothamist raised double their campaign goal, more than $200,000, and helped demonstrate that community-supported journalism was an idea that people would pay for. Some of their sister sites in other cities, like DCist and LAist, were inspired to run Kickstarter campaigns as well, and editors and writers from another local journalism site in Chicago, which had been ruined by the very same malevolent billionaire, used Kickstarter to fund an extremely successful relaunch as Block Club Chicago. Um, this one is a bit more international. The Civil Foundation has been trying to find a way to save journalism 
through the blockchain and cryptocurrency, but their initial coin launch last fall didn't go exactly as planned, and several of the burgeoning newsrooms they had helped start were left in the lurch. One of those was Popula, a young but adored site for global culture and criticism. The site's local sensibility and global reach resonated with hundreds of supporters, helping them raise nearly $30,000 and giving them a runway to continue their work. This was, that was one of the first campaigns that I got to work on when I got this job, and it also inspired several other newsrooms to do, run their own campaigns. Uh, Sludge, which is dedicated to investigating money in politics, ran a, their own $25,000 campaign to fund a long reporting project on fossil fuel lobbyists trying to kill America's Green New Deal. <clears throat> the work that they subsequently did also helped raise the Young Newsroom's profile in the international media. Just a few months ago, they participated in Covering Climate Now Week, coordinated by the Columbia Journalism Review and The Nation. Sludge partnered with The Guardian to produce an explosive investigation into the personal finances of U.S. senators, revealing more than 50 senators' investments in the firms they're supposed to be regulating. Good stuff. And then there, and there are projects in the works of many more civil newsrooms like Documented, Cannabis Wire, The Small Bow, and more. Uh, crowdfunding is also a really nice way to turn something digital into something physical. A writer named Porter Fox launched Nowhere Online back in 2008 in order to publish long-form travel stories, primarily from unknown writers. His goal wasn't ever to scale up or develop sponsorship partners. He just wanted to give great writers a great platform. To help bring in some additional revenue, in 2016, he kickstarted a Nowhere print compendium, collecting some of the best pieces from the site's eight years and immortalizing them in a more permanent way. That campaign went so well that Porter decided to make the print compendium an annual. He's run campaigns for each of the last four years, bringing in more money and more followers each time. The 2019 campaign raised more than $15,000 from more than 300 backers. Out in Los Angeles, three women of color started an experimental zine called Dum Dum in 2011. Each issue takes a completely different form, from a newsprint broadside to an audio CD to a book of postcards. When things get a little ambitious, they turn to Kickstarter. They've crowdfunded two issues, Punks and Scholars, which contains writing and multimedia objects that tuck into a record mailer, and their latest issue, Rise and Resist, a deconstructed zine plus ephemeral objects all packaged into a little steel box. Dum Dum has done an excellent job of building their community. Founder Tylene Colley told me that not a day goes by that they don't receive at least a few submissions for their next issue. We've also seen all sorts of literary events and series. This is one of my favorites. Back in 2013, a bunch of New York City literary ladies wanted to host a three-day reading of Herman Melville's classic whale book. After raising more than $8,000 on Kickstarter, the event planners coordinated 150 readers over three days, and they cooked enough chowder to feed the whole audience. Their rewards included Moby Dick-themed lithographs and jewelry, as well as custom sea shanties sung lovingly to high-level backers. Media campaigns can be about more than just the written word, of course. Uh, a few months ago, I worked with Tom Critchley, a British humanitarian who wanted to set up a radio station for refugees in Jordan, serving the war-impacted community in Zatari. The radio station is now up and running, and in addition to sharing news and information, it's also become a big hit with the community youth. Most recently, Critchley wrote, the kids in Zatari are over the moon to be able to broadcast their own shows, and they have taken the opportunity to be radio presenters extremely well. <clears throat> We're also seeing a ton of podcast campaigns lately. A nice example is this one by Amelia Hruby in Chicago. It's her second, and she has three more planned over the next several years. Eventually, she's going to have five 10-episode seasons of her podcast, 50 Feminist States, which highlights one, one feminist activist in each U.S. state. Just last month, Amelia shared that her podcast, which has 23 episodes finished so far, has surpassed 10,000 downloads. <coughs> And there are podcasts for sports, podcasts for self-help and wellness, political podcasts, and podcasts spinning out long science fiction fantasy stories. It's one of our ascendant categories, which is very cool to see. So that's a taste of what we're up to in Kickstarter journalism. From climate journalism to activist podcasts to marathon readings of books about whales, we are working to support any kind of creative project in the media ecosystem. Okay. Remember when I said this before, that every Kickstarter project is a story. Now I'm going to break that down a little bit and talk about the different elements that go into building these campaigns, the pieces that go into telling stories in really compelling ways. <coughs> Sorry, 
Okay. Uh, some people who come to Kickstarter think that running a crowdfunding campaign is like asking the universe for magical internet money. Like you can just slap up an idea and wait for all the cash to come pouring in. That is not true. These campaigns take work, creativity, enthusiasm, and perseverance. Luckily, journalists are some of the hardest working, creative, and enthusiastic folks around. The first part of the campaign that most people will see is the project video. This is the invitation into your story. It doesn't need to tell the whole thing in exhaustive detail. The best campaign videos are short, bright, fun, and compelling. The goal is for everyone who watches it to be really excited to learn more about this journey that you're inviting them to take with you. Uh, but there's plenty of nuance here. When Popula came to us, their campaign video was cute and clever, but it had one major pitfall. I forgot, here's a tech challenge. Uh, I'm gonna play this video. I have no idea if it will work and y'all will be able to hear it. So Sebastian, cool. will, you, will you tell me if this works? Yep. Okay. Uh, do you see it? video but this video was made with one single audience in mind and that's Popula's existing fans. It didn't say anything about what kind of writing the site published or why. It didn't give people who had never heard of them any reason to support their work. Kickstarter is a neutral platform that allows creators to share their work with the world in the hopes that it will resonate with an audience but we can also offer more than that. With millions of people in our community of backers we can get projects in front of all sorts of people who just don't know that they're your fans yet. You just have to give them a reason to love you. So with all of that in mind, here's a new video that Popula made. Popula is a journalist-owned, journalist-run, ad-free publication. We do not have any rich investors. We do not have anyone to please but ourselves and our readers. So we publish whatever we want, whatever we think our readers will find informative and fun. We tell stories about ordinary people living ordinary lives. We try to make everything we publish something we couldn't get anywhere else. Popular is focused on delivering diverse and unexpected views on public views and culture. We've been around for eight months and I feel that the church, the bosses, the project partners, just being editors and writers as decently as we can for our stories like these. We publish weird stuff. We publish funny stuff. We publish artists from India, Egypt, Kenya, as well as the United States. The donation will go to the editors and writers who are popular the uh, yeah, so that seemed to hit their goals much better and convince all kinds of people what they were doing and why it was worth supporting. The next and largest part of a campaign is the project description. This is where you can take a deep dive and really tell your story in all of its beautiful detail. What are you creating? Why should people care? Why should they give you their money and their email address so that they can take this journey with you? Here's a quick look at Erin Journal, a magazine about travel and culture in Africa. They've included text, mock-ups of their magazine, custom graphics, a detailed list of their rewards, illustrated with photos, a production timeline, and drawings of each member of the team. It's a dynamic, exciting campaign page that you just want to keep reading. And when you're done, you really have a full sense of what they're going to do and how they'll do it well. Now let's talk about rewards. It might not seem like it, but this is a big part of telling your story. 
There's a lasting misconception that if you run a Kickstarter campaign, you have to turn yourself into a swag production facility, making a whole array of keychains, mugs, t-shirts, tote bags, and all sorts of other junk. Do not do this. Not only will you ruin your life schlepping back and forth to the post office for six months, it's not even a good way to connect with your community. We try to help creators think about rewards in a different way. What are some less predictable things that you can share with people to encourage them to support what you're doing? And importantly, how do those things reinforce and enhance the project you're creating? The Gothamist campaign did this extremely well. The story they told was about how deeply embedded the site was in the fabric of New York City. And they supported that idea by offering really unique, only in New York rewards, many in partnership with local institutions. There were Smorgasburg Smorgasbucks, memberships to the Anthology Film Archives at Metrograph, nostalgia rides on the New York Transit Museum's vintage trains, concert tickets to Forest Hill Stadium, and lots of others. In addition to being very cool rewards that lots of people wanted, it reinforced the idea that Gothamist is so important to this city because all these venerable institutions supported them. <coughs> Here's a very different story. Chicago's nonprofit journalism lab, City Bureau, ran an extremely successful campaign with only one single reward tier for $10. Their story and the goal of their campaign wasn't about money, it was about people. They wanted to launch their newsroom with wide community support. So rather than line up a lot of expensive rewards, they made the barrier to entry very low in order to get a large number of individuals to join in. And it worked. By the end of their campaign, they had nearly 700 backers. You can also get really creative with rewards. I uh, have a campaign that just closed for a new cultural magazine called New Modality. Mid-campaign, the founder released a limited edition branded avocado, laser etched by a well-known artist provocateur. There were only a few offered as campaign rewards, and she also let backers know that anyone who tweeted about the new Mo Avo would be entered into a raffle to win one of their own, which is a really clever way to use rewards and social media in tandem to help promote what you're doing. That brings us to backer updates. These are Ariana, can I interrupt you for a second yeah. because there's a question here about rewards. So maybe, okay. should I read it to you so you can? Sure. Uh, all right, so Karsten is, is asking, what are typical rewards given by podcasts? For example, with print magazines, the product can be a good reward. For online magazines, exclusive content access might be a good reward. Do you have, any, do you have an example of a podcast with a good reward structure? Yeah, for sure. So the way to think about rewards, uh, the easiest thing to do is think about what you're already doing in your creative journey that you can pull out and frame up as rewards. So as you said, if you've got a digital content platform, you have a wealth of articles that you could package up in PDFs, for example. If you're doing a podcast, you can do outtakes, you can do bonus episodes, you can do field recordings, additional interviews, all of these things which are you're already going to be collecting in the process of doing your work um, and just figure, I mean, obviously it all depends on your bandwidth and, you know, the, the time and energy it takes to like package these things in a pretty way. Um, you can also have uh, all sorts of ways that people can participate in your creative work, like convening a panel to vote on the next person you should interview or the next place that you should go. Um, having people on your podcast can be a reward depending on your subject matter and your, you know, your sort of like the way that you're um, putting it all together. You can also do meetups or digital meetups depending on what kind of community you're working with. Um, so it really depends on the specifics of what you're doing, but any campaign there, because these campaigns are generating creative work, there are ways to repurpose that creative work in like limited edition and like exclusive sorts of ways. Oh, and then also partner rewards, which is what I was demonstrating about with the Gothamist campaign. <clears throat> um, whatever topic you're, or whatever like sort of category you're working in, um, if you're doing a podcast about tennis, you can probably get fancy tennis companies to donate some rackets make I mean that's a little high level but you know like think about who else is in your world that might be willing to contribute a limited number you can limit reward tiers to like as low as one um so you don't have to necessarily ask someone for like an infinite number of rackets depending who backs your campaign um but so yeah so the <clears throat> the two best ways to think about it are stuff that you're already doing and stuff that other people are doing that will cost you no effort because they're going to handle the fulfillment um, I can 
I have a lot more information on all of this stuff. And so I encourage anybody who's watching, I'm going to have my email address and my Twitter handle at the end of this. Um, I would be delighted to have an individual conversation with everybody about the specifics of what you're doing. Cool. cool. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on to backer updates. Um, these are missives that you send during the course of your campaign to the people who have already supported you. Um, this is your story playing out in real time, and it's an absolutely crucial way to keep your supporters engaged and build momentum throughout your campaign. Um, venerable literary magazine Friction used updates to encourage their backers to help spread the word about their campaign as it came close to the end. They offered exclusive rewards to people who were already supporting them, like handmade bookmarks and a special VIP section on their website for people who shared the campaign on social media. Other campaigns have used backer updates to tell their stories more deeply. Lewis Wallace, a journalist, trans rights activist, and anti-racism organizer, <clears throat> ran a campaign to launch a new podcast telling the stories of journalists from marginalized communities throughout history. Lewis made his campaign goal in 24 hours, but he didn't stop there. He sent backer updates every couple of days, updating his campaign goal, sharing information about his collaborators, and releasing new rewards. His updates linked to Twitter threads with article after article embedded in them, all sharing ways that Lewis's personal journey had brought him to this work and what he'd learned along the way. They were fascinating and compelling, and lots and lots of people clicked day after day. The campaign closed, having raised $10,000 more than its original goal. Uh, one last backer update I really love. Sometimes sharing your story means getting extremely personal, like Ashley Rector, who ran a campaign to launch a women's media site called Harness Magazine this past fall. She was pretty excited to let all of her backers know that in addition to starting a media empire, she'd also given birth mid-campaign. She even enclosed a photo of what's probably the youngest Kickstarter backer ever. The final step in telling your story is who you tell it to and how you continue telling it throughout the life of your campaign. Promotion is one of the most crucial predictors of crowdfunding success. It is, after all, how you reach your crowd. Uh, here's one of my favorite statistics about Kickstarter. If you look at all the campaigns and all the categories over the last 10 years, you'll find that these projects have a success rate of about 32% is pretty low. But if you only look at projects that have at least 25 backers, the success rate jumps to 80%, which means if you're promoting these campaigns even a little bit, if you're reaching an audience that's just slightly larger than your mom, your childhood best friend, your next door neighbor, then your chances of success are actually really high. Promotion can be the least sexy element of a campaign, sending hundreds of emails, scheduling tweets weeks in advance, designing MailChimp campaigns, but it can also be really fun. Todd Shalom, the founder of Elastic City, an organization that leads participatory art walks around New York, knew that most social media platforms these days have tweaked their algorithms to deprioritize funding messages. So he made sure to use images that would break through. This is my favorite from his campaign. He used it to announce a weekend of matching donations from an anonymous backer. Another creator wanted to get away from social media altogether and go extremely analog with one lavish gesture. He did something else totally unexpected. He bought a series of billboards in Los Angeles. The three awesome women behind that experimental zine, Dum Dum, also wanted to engage their community offline. So throughout their campaign, they did live radio programs and hosted music shows. The ticket prices were paid in campaign donations. One of the founders, Taylene Kali, is a cosmic femme punk singer, and she headlined some of the events, which brought in hundreds of dollars in pledges. The best thing about unorthodox promotional methods like these is not just that they can make money for your project, but they can increase the community of supporters who will stick around with you for the life of your campaign and beyond. Once a project is funded, the creator gets contact info from everyone who backed him. You now have a direct line to all these new supporters who want to be on your journey with you, who are excited to watch what you're about to create come to life, and then help you keep it alive. It's your guarantee that all the time and effort that went into making your campaign a success will continue long after it's done. And there you have it. Everything you need to know to save the world through Kickstarter journalism. Great. Thank you for listening. Um, and yeah, this is where you can find me online. Um, Sebastian, what would you like to do? I'm going to unshare my screen. Um, do you want to do your presentation and then we'll both take questions or should I take some more questions and then um, we'll click over? Well, there's one question here already. So uh, if you don't mind, why not uh, answer Great. that right away, right? Yeah. I can read it to you. Maybe that's... Oh yeah, let me unshare. Uh -huh. 
All right, so here's a question from Ray. Can a group of journalists who are still planning their startup do crowdfunding here, or do they must do they must establish first their outlet? So do they have to be a, an established outfit, uh, outlet before they can start a Kickstarter? Totally. Um, you don't have to, <clears throat> there's no requirements. You can absolutely, um, you can do it either way. Uh, you just want to be strategic about what you're doing. There are pros and cons to each. Um, launching something is an exciting time to do a Kickstarter. Um, I guess going back to every Kickstarter is a story. The story that you're telling with your campaign is always going to be answering the questions, why me and why now? So why should people donate money to this cause? Well, we're launching. It's new. It's exciting. We have this wonderful idea and we're ready to like bring it out into the world. So that's a good, especially if it's like a particularly unique entry into the media landscape, you can get a lot of press around that. You know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of ways that, that that's a really compelling narrative. However, you don't have a body of work to draw on or proof of concept um, to convince people that you will definitely be able to do this thing. Um, so, you know, you'll have to go some way to uh, easing people's minds, you know, um, sharing bios of the writers who are involved, you know, letting people know the kinds of previous work you've done, laying out how you're going to use the money and what you're going to make. All of that can be done, but that's the sort of flip side of using a Kickstarter for a launch. On the other hand, you have pros and cons for an existing media outlet. It's the reverse of all of those things. You know, you have proof of concept, body of work, a whole track record, a lot of um, assets and materials to demonstrate your competence and to, as I was saying before, like package up into rewards. But you're going to have to work a little bit harder to say, well, so if you were doing this thing already, why should we pay you money to keep doing it? So you just have to think about how you're telling your story and make a compelling case for why people should give you money, regardless of what stage of your journey you're on. Great. Thank you. Uh, I think there's no uh, more questions at the moment. Please add more for Ariana so we can answer them later on. Um, right. Sebastian, should I read your bio before you start since you did that for me? Yeah. yeah I would like to you. reintroduce you all to Sebastian Esser. He co-founded the reader-funded online magazine Kraut Reporter and the European membership platform Steady. He has written for Vanity Fair and VISDP. I don't know what that stands for, uh, but he is also very fancy. You don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> and he's gonna, I'm gonna mute myself and he's gonna tell you all about Steady. All right, so let me share my screen. Um, all right, I hope you can all see this. So Ar Ar Ariana, maybe tell me if it doesn't work, but you should all see my screen. Uh, right now. So I'm guessing that many of you listeners are journalists yourself, are running your own publications, are thinking of starting one, be it like a digital magazine, a blog, a podcast, something like that. Um, and I want you to bear with me for a second and look at the, these two dimensions here. And one would be privileges, so something uh, that you get in return for uh, your money. Uh, first and foremost, that would be content that is put behind a paywall and only if you pay, you can start uh, reading. Um, and the other dimension is passion. So either there's a lot of passion, you feel strongly about a publication or a media brand because of its political tendency, its specific niche, the person behind it, the personality of the writers, um, or even a topic like, let's say, Brexit, climate change, and so on. So either you're very passionate or there's no passion at all. Uh, either you get something in return or you get nothing in return, right? So um, moving on, let's look at uh, some uh, well-known media brands uh, and try to categorize them in here. And I realize this might be a little bit um, uh, um, you know, we, we can fight about this if we want to, but please, please don't. Just trying to, to, to make a point and uh, we can discuss later. So, uh, for example, something like BuzzFeed, there's clearly no privileges when you start paying because there's no way they don't want you to pay. It's made for reach, right? They try to reach as many people as possible with uh, uh, content that provides buzz. It's about entertainment. It's about a lot of entertainment. Same goes for something like CNN.com 
where you get breaking news, uh, you know, hundreds of articles, uh, I guess, every day. So uh, here it's about volume, it's about, you know, speed. Um, and, and their business model is, uh, uh, is uh, ads because this is about selling the eyeballs of your, <clears throat> of your audience to, to advertisers. So there's, there's not a good uh, different way uh, of making money with that type of content. Um, and the problem here is that the, um, yeah, the, 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 this method of selling ads is working less and less uh, uh, for media. Uh, I mean, it's still growing. The ad, online ad market is, is growing, of course, but all this growth goes to the big social media companies like Facebook, Google, but also Alibaba, uh, Amazon and the like, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't work for most media anymore, uh, especially not for niche independent media that can't provide the kind of content that will uh, generate really big audiences. So if you look in this spectrum over here <clears throat> where there's no privileges still, but there's a lot of passion, there's a different story here. So for example, something like NPR in the U S you know, public radio, they run yearly pledge drives where they ask them their, their listeners for money to kind of fill their coffers for the year uh, just because they share the vision of good quality radio. And that's how, how people start, why, why they start, start paying. Uh, another very well-known example would be The Guardian in, in the UK that has become a worldwide brand around uh, um, people who are willing to pay even though they don't really have to pay. Um, but also something like GoFundMe, uh, where you just ask for money for a good cause, is, is based on, on this principle. And this would be one of donations. And uh, since, since uh, uh, you know, we're, we're here in the, and uh, uh, in, in, uh, talking uh, with you, uh, Oriana, I don't think that Kickstarter belongs in this section, just, just to be clear about that. Um, this is, this would be something where you just ask people to pay to continue doing what you're already doing without a great campaign or something. The problem here is that it's really hard to turn that into a, um, into a business model. This is really a one-off thing. And if you pay your 10 bucks, you probably have the feeling that you've contributed enough to that uh, publication. And, uh, and so it may help you a little bit, uh, but in the end, there's no recurring income. That's nothing that you can work with on a, on a continuous regular basis, right? Moving on up here, um, this is where most big media are nowadays. Uh, they have moved there in the past, let's say five years. So uh, there's a lot of privileges, but not, not, a, not a big sense of purpose or passion. So a good example would be the music platforms like Spotify, um, where you get all the music in the world for less than 10 bucks, I guess, at least over here in Europe. But this is a transactional relationship. You want that music, but if you get it for $5 uh, on Apple Music, you would just switch, right? So it's not so much about your connection, your relationship with the brand or with the people behind that brand, but it's more a transactional relationship where you kind of buy access to a pool of exclusive content, but that's, this content needs to be really, really good. So for example, the New York Times, I think we can all agree there's great quality content, but how many people in the world can produce that kind of content? Uh, uh, and, 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 and so um, it's really hard to pull off for smaller publications, for niche publications, for people, people uh, like myself who just don't have the means to produce the amount and the quality of content that, uh, that you would need to kind of you know, make an offering that is worth paying for. Especially if you think about something like Netflix or Spotify, you know, all this really great content, all, this, all the music in the world for less than 10, 10 bucks, how great can journaly actually, uh, journalism actually be, right? If, if, if that's our competition, yeah, it, it's a hard, it's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough pitch. So that's the problem with subscriptions. It tends to work for very few, very big publications. It increasingly looks like a, like a winner takes all market where there's in every country, there's like three or four media brands that can pull this off. But for most of the other media, 
local media, niche media, publications for small, tight communities, um, this pitch doesn't work. Pay so you can get access to, to, to this content. All right, and, and this is what I would really uh, actually want to talk about, <laughs> this space uh, up here where there are some privileges, but also there's a lot of passion. And that's uh, what's happened in the past, uh, let's say five years, where all over the world, these publications have sprung up that are based on passion, on connecting with their members. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying members uh, uh, because that's what it's called, membership. So there's Mediapart in, uh, in, in Paris, there's uh, the correspondent in Amsterdam, uh, you've mentioned the publication that I'm a co-founder of in Germany called Kautoporter. There's Republik in Switzerland. Also a lot of publications in the US are now membership based, a lot of local news, but also something like Slate or The Atlantic that is actually, um, uh, you know, legacy media. And everything that happens on Patreon, uh, you could argue, is based a lot on passion and purpose and, you know, a sense of community between the creator or the publisher and, uh, and, and their, their readers, listeners and followers. And that's what we call memberships and that's what Steady is all about. And we're here to help you set up a membership uh, program for yourself. Um, but let me first, before I, I, I talk more about Steady and what we can help you with, uh, uh, stay, stay on this uh, logic a little bit, because what's happened in the past few years is that some publications from the other spaces have started, suddenly started moving into the membership space. So even something like Quartz, which is clearly originally, you know, started, I think, five or six years ago for the REACH business model, are now offering memberships and are putting a lot of energy into making this work. Also something like Vox are offering memberships, even TechCrunch uh, uh, and, and also The Guardian has, has moved a little bit in, in what they offer. Um, I would also argue that The New York Times and The Washington Post are not really offering subscriptions anymore, but more, more on that a little later. All right, so just very quickly, Steady is a membership platform for independent media. So that means we want to help you set up a membership program, even if you're not the New York Times, but you have a small but tight community around your brand, about your, around your idea, sometimes even around yourself, because you're, you know, uh, you're very active on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and so on. Um, so um, that's not a lot of ways to to turn this into a sustainable business model membership is one and steady wants to make it really easy for you to set that up and how that works i'm gonna um, try to put into three uh, uh, small steps um, it's really as easy as setting up a kickstarter campaign as easy or as hard but it's, it's quite similar so there's three start steps the first step would be to get in contact with your crowd to, to ask for an email address so you can establish a, a, a stream of communication, you can start talking to them. Sometimes we um, hear this comparison that, you know, when you uh, go on a date, then you will not pull out the wedding ring on your first date, right? You will try to get to know the other person first. So uh, it's, it's basically what I'm saying is, First, start to establish contact and start talking to your community if you don't already do that. Uh, and, and the best way is to collect email addresses. And the second thing is really important, uh, and that's really what you know makes membership different from subscriptions, is that you communicate with your community. And that doesn't have to mean that you have to answer any email that you get and you know this turning into a, a huge lot of work. Uh, but um, surveys and polls can work really great here where you can just ask people to uh, answer questions and then you get a good sense of who your community is. You can ask other questions and what's really important here is that you actually care, that you actually are interested in what you want to know because that means that people will tell pretty easily whether you're sincerely asking for their opinions, whether you're actually interested in forming a relationship or whether it's just a form of, you know, triggering engagement. And what is important here in the communication part is that people understand what the purpose of your 
um, publication is. And I can't stress that enough because that's actually what you're selling. That's your product, uh, the purpose. And most media projects do have a purpose. Most of them have a strong purpose. I mean, that's, that's one advantage uh, among the many disadvantages that media has. Uh, but most of the time it's implicit. Usually people say something, you know, name of brand, magazine for X, Y, Z. Really what it should say is what is your purpose? What is the soul of your publication? Why are you here? What is the core of what connects you with your audience? And if you, uh, if you pay close attention to uh, the big media, a lot has happened in the past few years. So for example, uh, look at something like the Washington Post, as soon as Trump was elected, they said democracy dies in darkness as their motto. That's not about a newspaper, right? That's not about the number of articles that you get. It's about the value that connects you uh, uh, at, at its core. Uh, if you want to protect democracy from some, someone like Trump, then you better become part of that community and then you have to gonna have to start paying. Similarly, uh, at the New York Times, and Ariana, you can tell me later whether it's true, but I've heard that in a lot of US kitchens, these posters have, have, have started to appear from the New York Times uh, shop, where it says a little more than truth. You know, how, how, how much, much more simple can you get? So if, if you believe that the truth is really important, then you can connect this statement with the New York Times and by be becoming a subscriber of the New York Times or member, as we would say, that's how you show your value. Another example is pretty recent from The Guardian. They've started uh, changing the whole communication uh, and their, their slogan is, change is possible, hope is power. And actually, if you look at the video, all it does, it shows is a butterfly flying against the window and it's really depressing. And after a while, the window suddenly breaks, the butterfly flies into the fresh air. And that's the statement that the Guardian wants you to understand. This is all about change, it's about hope. So if you become a supporter of the Guardian, this is what you're saying. And I think you have that purpose in your publications too. It's usually implicit. It's usually that implicit that you don't know yourself. You, you don't have this one sentence, but you need to find that sentence and kind of put that into on your website. It's pretty easy. I mean, just to talk about um, myself at Kaltoporter when we introduced a little sentence which says, understand the connections, which is kind of our slogan that you know, we could feel the difference in terms of uh, how much money we were uh, making additionally, just because people understood what they were getting. So this should also be a promise uh, and you should put yourself in the shoes of your potential uh, members and, and kind of tell them what you're all about. And then the third part, and here's where steady is probably more important than in the other, um, in the other parts is the conversion. So how do you turn mem uh, users uh, who, you know, occasional readers, people who follow you on social media or have to subscribe to a newsletter, how do you convert them into paying members? And there's several ways to do that and we, we can help and steady with our product. So three ways, uh, exclusive access, second reward, just like on, on Kickstarter, like a, the crowdfunding logic, and third, provide communities where people can start talking to you and to each other. So one feature that Steady has that might be interesting for you is that you can, uh, oh, I should maybe start by, by saying how Steady works. So you just set up a Steady page, just like a Kickstarter page, and then you can you know, define some different plans that have different prices and different rewards that, you, that people can choose among uh, them. And then there's, you know, this little tweaks that will help you get people converted. One would be trial memberships. So most people are kind of afraid of starting a subscription because they feel then once they've started, it's really hard to get out of. Um, and that doesn't work really work anymore. So it's, it's, if you use Steady, it's really easy to cancel this membership, but it's also really easy to start a membership. If you choose to, you can offer free trials where people, you know, leave their payment info, but if they cancel within the first 30 days, then they, they um, nothing happens. But in effect, if they like 
uh, what they are getting as, as trial members. They don't have, don't have to do anything. So conversion from trial membership to actual membership is pretty high. Second option is guest memberships where you can, you know, promise more than one account in return for a membership so that let's say your boyfriend also wants access to this magazine uh, behind the paywall they get a second uh, he gets a second membership too uh, and then you can you know offer different tiers or different levels where you where you have uh, uh, a different number of guest memberships uh, and and that's a way to get <clears throat> to get uh, to sell more ex expensive plans just like on Spotify or Netflix. So, you know, as you can see here, and sorry for this being German, uh, in German, there's different tiers and uh, the price is, um, is uh, depends on the number of seats or accounts and you can do the same with Steady. And you can also actually use goals just like on Kickstarter, where you can, for example, say, well, we want to reach a thousand euros uh, recurring revenue uh, next month. Uh, and then we can add another episode to our, to our, uh, our podcast. Uh, and, and that, you know, these ways of communicating uh, on the internet and in the crowdfunding era are also part of the steady product. Uh, you can choose to offer monthly or yearly plans uh, and, and then you know, offer a little rebate for the annual option because when people only pay once a year, you save on the payment costs and also churn is lower. So the fewer people cancel if it only renews once a year. And all that is already part of the Steady product. I should also say what is really important to understand uh, about Steady is that it works on your website. You know, so uh, it's not at platform where all of your users have to come to steady actually it's not the steady story we kind of try to keep in the background but you can embed all of that on your website also we can um, you can use steady to set up a paywall so if you choose you don't have to do that but if you choose to offer some of your content exclusively to paying members then uh, you're good to go. It's really easy to install and actually only takes five minutes. And then you have a paywall on your blog or your magazine. Same goes for podcasts. Uh, the other question before is in that regard, where you can offer exclusive feeds for your uh, members. So uh, let's say you have a podcast that has a new episode every week, you could add another episodes only for paying members and only as long as they pay will this uh, RSS feed work for them. Uh, or you can post your episodes uh, a little early or you can, for example, post additional uncut interviews, stuff like that and people really appreciate that or make it ad free. So there's a lot of ways you can provide extra um, rewards uh, without having to uh, produce, uh, necessarily having to put more work, work, work in it. A little uh, bit about the cost at the end. Um, so there's no cost involved initially, only when you start making money uh, will we get a 10% fee of that money. So that means only when you make money do we make money and that's why we are really interested in making you successful. We're a pretty small company yet uh, uh, so far. So uh, if you just call me or call us, send us an email, there's a really good chance that we will do our best to help you get set up. Even if you have loads of questions, don't know where to start, we'll take you by the hand and, 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 and guide you through through this and, um, and, and get you set up with memberships. If you choose to, you can start today. It's really that easy. Uh, you can work on it for a couple of weeks before you get set up. Uh, but most important uh, uh, difference to the crowdfunding that is um, more well known so far is that, that you don't have to plan a huge campaign initially. You can start slowly and then you know start learning about what works, what your community wants. Maybe you'll only make you know 100 euros in the first uh, 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 month, but uh, you can start from there as long as you start. Because most people in our experience take much too long, they're missing out on a lot of revenue and a lot of you know, connections with their potential members. Because in our experience, people want to pay. 
you just have to give them the chance to pay and there's a there's a price to to uh, uh, to waiting too long i'll stop here and i'm happy to to answer any questions and maybe oriana we can just open the floor to everybody and i'll switch off my presentation just this last slide here ask yourself where on this spectrum are you right now and where do you want to be uh, in 2020 where do you want to go if you draw an arrow on this uh, on, on this slide where would you like to land uh, let's say at the, at the end of next next year thank you that was so great thank you yeah thank you um, it looks like we have two questions currently uh, it looks like one is kind of for me and one is for the both of us um, so I'm going to, I'm going to answer this question from Christina real quick. And then, so Christina, Christina asks, are you doing crowdfunding for any country? I'm from Romania and developed a network of 30 local media outlets. Are we eligible? Um, I'm going to answer that part first. So Kickstarter is, our payment processor is Stripe, which is a huge international company that moves money all around uh, the world. We're constrained in where we can uh, move money by what they can do. So uh, for you can back a Kickstarter project from anywhere in the world. There's no limitations on that. But in order to launch a Kickstarter project, you do need to be in a Stripe approved country. Um, I'm going to, I have a link here um, from our FAQ of who can use Kickstarter. I believe I can type it right into this box, Christina. Let me know. Oh, now your questions disappeared. I see. Uh, yeah, so look at that. Romania is not on there. Um, the workaround is if you have a bank account in a country that is um, that we are open in, um, a lot of creators, uh, I'm working with somebody in Beirut who's got a sister in Paris and he runs the money through. I'm not really supposed to tell you to do that, but that's what people do. Um, so, but if you have more specific questions about Romania about a particular country again like I just don't want to take up everybody's time on like super minutia but Christina please feel free to get in touch with me um, if you would like more specifics and then the second part of your question says is this registered could one see later on your presentation I think you're asking if my presentation is like online somewhere it's not but we are recording this um, Sebastian where yeah. will this be that's a good question, but we'll publish it. Uh, I don't know yet where, I'm guessing uh, in our blog or on Facebook, but we'll certainly let you know. I think we have a list of, of the participants' emails and we'll, uh, we'll uh, get, it, uh, get, get you the link. Great, great. Um, yeah, maybe I can, I can add something to the Romania question because we actually have a publisher in Romania that, uh, that runs on Steady uh, Inclusive RO. Uh, you may have heard of them, uh, um, um, Christina, and um, and they were really successful. They now get uh, 8,000 euros every month, and they've you know kind of created their own uh, uh, newsroom, and they they will they've been able to get uh, more than 100,000 euros uh, within four weeks or something uh, early uh, this year. Um, so it does work uh, even in Romania, where they uh, you know. Uh, the uh, um, income is a problem for a lot of people, but uh, but it does work. And and if you're interested to in learning more uh, about that, I'm I'm happy to connect you with with uh, Stefan to from Inclusive. I have to say that we don't offer Romanian lei as a currency, but most people were happy to just pay in euro and using using um, you know credit cards, PayPal, and, and the like. Cool. Um, so I should, I, I guess, let's, there's a chance I'm going to have to, I might get kicked out of this room and I'll have to shuffle. So that's why I keep sure. looking to see if somebody's going to come in. Um, but I, we should, let's see. So the, the first question, sorry, Karsten, I skipped you. Um, so this is a really good question. The question here, Kickstarter is campaign driven and more short term. Steady is crowd sustaining and more long term. Um, you're asking for specific examples of media outlets using both uh, a, a Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Crowd Reporter, and also a platform like Steady, or I assume you meant Patreon. Um, so I'm going to answer this in a broad way, and then of course, Sebastian, I'll let you talk about it. Um, I am, I am extremely in favor of a diversity of funding streams for a media outlet. I think um, using, you're absolutely right, Karsten, that um, Kickstarter is 
fixed project-based funding, whereas something like steady is sustainable funding, and there are absolutely ways to use them in tandem. Um, both of the civil newsrooms that I talked about in my presentation, Popula and Sludge, um, they both have civil. I think that one of them also has a Patreon. They also have done Kickstarters. Like it's all about you need to think about who you're talking to. Um, one thing to be aware of is sort of like donor fatigue. So if you're asking the same people for money in like three different ways at the same time, people might get annoyed with you. Um, but think about how, like use each one the way it's designed and then you can make it all make sense. So like a sort of a, a low hum of sustainable funding with a steady, with a Patreon or something like that is, we need to like shift people's thinking readers and consumers that like that's the cost of doing business that it costs money to create media and money should be coming in all the time if you if that is already uh like an understanding that you've set up with your audience a way to use kickstarter is for like bursts of things so like a big project that's sort of like parallel to your general operating um something like porter fox's uh print compendium so like his regular operations are taken care of with like sustainable funding memberships things like this but then when he wants to do a big thing um, another example like that <coughs> there's a, a magazine in boston called orion which is like a it's like a nature magazine they're like 30 years old for sweet old hippies um and so they have subscribers and members and fundraising drives and all of that so that's for their regular operating um i just ran a campaign with them where they're making a book of a compendium of stories about love, which will come out in February in time for Valentine's Day. Um, and so since that's sort of outside of the nature of what they regularly do, that made sense to fund as a project. Yeah, that's, I think, example, print editions, uh, books, events, and all that, that's probably better on Kickstarter. Oh yeah, events, totally, totally. Ariana, if you have to go uh, and, and people are uh, scratching your door, please, please store it if you. If you can I like I did some trickery. I reserved a different room. So if somebody comes and says they want this room, I'm going to try to send them to that room. Yeah, no I problem. Yeah, yeah. If you have to go, that's fine. I'll, I'll stay uh, for the rest of the answers. But if you can stay, that's, that's great. No, I'd love to stay. This is great. Um, I think that's good for Karsten. Although Karsten, let us know if you think that we need to elaborate. Uh, oh, and then I think this is for you, Sebastian. Yeah. Kickstarter is open for all types of uh, creators. Is that just for media projects? No, you can uh, you, you can sell memberships for anything, and people do. I mean, our publisher we, we call them independent publishers. So of course there needs to be a stream of content of some sort. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, but uh, they don't have to be professional journalists. There's a lot of podcasters who don't do this, you know, for a living or even uh, in in my radio professional sense or something it's just where we personally come from that's where it started but there's a lot of comic artists newsletter writers all that uh, um, uh, on, on steady it doesn't have to be media or journalism um, cool all right Ed, i think this is for you from doran constantine yeah, I mean, uh, an ad free area, we have a tool with, that helps you kind of get rid of ads for paying members. So once people log in, they don't see the ads. So that's doable. Yeah, I mean, hit me up if you need any details about that later on. So I'm not, I'm actually unclear, Carola, about this question. Do you have experiences with a very specific topic for experts? Are you? What's hematology? Do you know, Oriana? Hem -hem hematology, maybe that's Hemat about blood. That might be like the study of blood. I don't know, but, mm -hmm. but I, if, if you could elaborate on this question, I'm, I'm not sure which of us you're asking and what kinds of examples you're looking for. I mean, for. We, we do have one publication called a Science for Physiotherapists, and it's, it's, it's kind of a specialist information for this specific group of people. It's really successful. It's one of our biggest uh, publishers, even though it's not content that any of us would be interested in. But since their you know, target audience is really, really um, interested in that uh, uh, content, it works really well. I mean, the, the willingness to pay is clearly there. And, and as I said, they're, they're, they've, it's 
changed their income stream completely. It's one of the biggest uh, publications we have on Steady. Yeah, I mean, I would just add to that that any um, niche, uh, niche passionate audiences are ideal. If, if what you're doing is too general, it can be really difficult to target, to know how to target anyone to increase your fan base. Um, but yeah, if whether your niche audience is uh, doctors studying blood cancer or, you know, cosplayers going to Renaissance fairs, if it's people who are like extremely passionate about the topic that you are dealing with, um, as, so long as you know where they are and how to reach them, um, those are the projects that tend to have the most success on platforms like Kickstarter. All right, so most of the other questions were, um, you know, um, answers to, to, uh, to original questions. So thank you for that. Um, I, mean, I mean, that was the last question. If anyone has any more questions, oh, here we go. Also for, for me, you've mentioned the membership where members can communicate with us and members to members like uh, a social network. Yeah, what I mean by that is that people who are start who are paying members uh, want to be closer to you and to each other. So this is a com if, if you know if this is about community, then you want as a community to communicate. We don't we haven't built this. We don't need that because it really depends on the type of community you are. Some people use something like WhatsApp groups, Facebook groups. Uh, as, uh, Discord is, is, is uh, well uh, known in, in a lot of um, spaces. So really what you want to do is just create a space where only your members have access to, and that is also closed off to the wider internet. That could also be the comment section on your website uh, where it works wonders. You know, the, the atmosphere and the type of uh, comments that are being written in these closed off communities are really great. It, it's, it's, it's a really great experience to, um, to not be out in the open where people start, uh, um, you know, spreading hate, but being inside a community of like-minded people really changes the conversation. And it's really a thing that makes, makes a membership worthwhile paying for. Um, so for Biete, uh, Africa is, so the question is, do you have examples of successful media projects in Africa? So I'm going to share a link to Erin Journal, which I, I talked about in the presentation. Um, you'll note, though, that they have launched their camp, they, they ran their campaign in London, because again, we're not exactly open in Africa, certainly not all of Africa, maybe not any of Anyway, so um, if you will send me an email, I can do a more advanced search. That's just the one I know of off the top of my head, um, but I can sort of, I, I would just have to kind of like back into that search because again, it won't just be listed as Africa. Um, but if you email me, I'll, I'll see if I can find some other examples for you. Yeah, also we have some um, successful publications in South Africa. Of course, that's, you know, in terms of Africa, that's very developed. So uh, we don't have a lot of experience in, in other parts of Africa, but in South Africa, it works really great. It works in US dollars though, not in African Rand, but we have started offering Afri African South African Rand in the past um, couple of months. But if you're looking for other um, African countries, I'm pretty sure it can work. For example, I'm talking to this uh, journalist from uh, Zimbabwe and um, where the inflation is 700%. So it's really hard to make a living under these circumstances. At the same time, there's a lot of people outside of Zimbabwe who, are, who would be willing to support something that they feel is really important and, and that can really make, an, make a huge difference. Oriana, I think we're done. Uh, I think we did it. Yes. Um, yes, this was so nice. I just, uh, I, I've done, I do a lot of these webinars and m more than half the time, we ask for questions and there are no questions. So it is like really, really delightful to, uh, to get your questions. I love doing that. I really do. I would be delighted to have a, a, an individual phone call with everyone watching. I'm sure Sebastian would too. Um, yeah, we're, I'm, I'm, thank you so much for spending an hour and nine minutes uh, listening to us babble a little bit. 
Yeah, the same from, from me. Thanks for all of you, for, uh, uh, to all of you for coming and especially thanks to you, Ariana, for taking the time and answering our questions and bringing those two communities together. It was really interesting and, uh, yeah. and, and I hope we can do this another time in the future. That would be wonderful. Everybody have a, great have a wonderful day. holiday and a weekend and all the rest of it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.